Good evening. Um, my testimony is really God's testimony. And I've written down, and I will read from this just because uh, I don't necessarily have to, but I don't want to get carried away with my sin of my past in that that would be the focus and when really what the Lord has done in saving me from all that is really where we need to praise him and give him the glory so I'm going to follow this format for the most part but know this I was a wicked wicked sinner uh, as we all are so <clears throat> come before you today to profess my faith in Jesus Christ and ask to be baptized and for membership in this church. As I said, my testimony is not my own. It's, it's God's testimony is what he did in my life. I can tell you firsthand that we have a loving, patient, long-suffering father who desires to see all come to him. My walk with the Lord has been lifelong. I'm 51 years old and even before I knew him, he knew me. He protected me and guided me and used many others to bring me to him. Um, I was born in Chicago. I grew up in Roselle. I was number five of six kids in a large Irish Catholic family. I was raised in a loving home by doting parents and siblings. My extended family was the same, large and Irish and Catholic. My parents were very active active in the Catholic religion, and we did all the sacraments. Church was something we did faithfully, and going to heaven was assumed because we were Catholic. We were baptized, and that was something that we never really gave a thought to. And if I was asked, I would have told you at that time I was a Christian. Danette and I met in high school. I was 17, and she was 15. We were married in May of 1986 in the Catholic Church. During this time, I lived primarily for myself, and I uh, was very selfish. Angela, our daughter, was born in May of 1987, and our son Dan in 1990, February of 1990. I believed at that time it was my sole responsibility to support my family through work, and that it was Danette's responsibility to raise our kids and run the household. And this continued for many years, and as you can imagine, put much strain on our marriage and my relationship with my kids because I worked seven days a week and often more than just eight hours a day. And the Lord was even protecting me then. We moved from church to church, moved from the Catholic Church to the Lutheran Church where we, where we became members and we enrolled our kids in their school. Angela graduated eighth grade. We pulled Danny out in the fifth grade due to some conflicts we had. But it was at that church where we, I was introduced to the Bible for the first time, really. Uh, from there, we moved to the Evangelical Free Church in Itasca. It was at this church that I really heard the gospel for the first time. And the pastor there, I was not attend I would go occasionally, but uh, he was encouraging me that um, I should attend on Sunday and not work, and that by working, I was trusting in myself and not the Lord to provide for my family. He explained the cross to me for the first time, and I was starting to understand something that I was always confused about is how, you know, a, a man could die 2,000 years ago for the sins I committed that very morning. And um, he, the picture and how Jesus paid the price at that time was beginning to unfold. I was told at that time because I was coming to that understanding I should be baptized, but it was not required, and I was told that it was just an outward expression of an inward change. And I really don't do anything that I don't have to do. So, in 2006, my father passed away in my arms while we were working together. And I saw before my eyes how quickly a person can be taken from this earth, and how permanent and final death is. This impacted my life greatly, where I cannot speak any more about it. Uh, in 2008, at that same church, 
the youth pastor uh, showed the, the youth group, which was a rambunctious, out-of-control group of kids at times, uh, Paul Washer's shocking youth video. Uh, Danette and I attended that meeting, and we were bowled over. We were, we were convicted to the core, and our eyes were, again, beginning to be opened further, and we began to understand that Christianity is not a game. It's not, it's not something that you, you say on Sunday morning, and, and then you live in the world the rest of the week. Um, we knew that something was not right with our understanding. We saw the awesome, reverent work of God through his son and his word, and we wanted to talk to Paul Washer. Danette found that he was speaking at a Bible conference in, at Faith Bible in Springfield, and one month later we went down to see, see him. Paul Washer met with us for many hours that weekend. I was um, constantly, I, I was really watching his body language more than anything else. I uh, was waiting for him to look at his watch and tell us he had to get going, and uh, he never did. And we spoke into the early morning hours, and uh, what a wonderful blessing that was. It changed our life. Uh, the pastor of that church, Kurt Daniel, uh, we spoke with him. We asked him for any like-minded churches in our area. He told me there were very few, and he gave us a list of a few. And uh, one was in Orland Park, we visited. One was in Winfield, we visited. The other one was Tabernacle in Hanover Park. And the last was in Woodstock uh, Heritage Baptist. And obviously we went to Heritage or to uh, Tabernacle and met Pastor Black. And we stayed there. Um, Pastor Black began to counsel us and was the beginning of uh, many, many hours of uh, godly counsel, wisdom, tears, fears, anger. I believe at this time the Lord was drawing us for the first time. We were beginning to see, I was beginning to see how and what my understanding of a husband and a father was and how wrong it was and my failure was just before me. The pastor showed us in the Bible that we were living very much in the world. I saw Danette was very depressed and she was convicted by the things we were learning about the Lord, about the Word, about herself and our marriage our, and myself. And I told Pastor, I said, if that's Christianity, I don't want it. And um, he, got, he got right back at me, and in a loud voice and in pointing to the window, he told me, then I can go straight to hell. And um, that was a language I, I was very familiar with and I could understand, but was shocked to hear it coming from a pastor. So what happened later through the years was more of a growing knowledge of the word, Christianity. We listened to many sermons, saw many preachers. The pendulum now, however, was going from one side to the other. Living in the world, which we had down, was beginning to swing. And um, 2011, the Lord used many things, many times to break me down. I would beat, thought I could fight and beat down again. And as Marcel has said, throw the flag up. That's what I, that's what I wanted and needed to do. And I was beginning to see it. It was in the fall that the Lord placed on me a, <clears throat> a burden and a trial. It was very heavy, so heavy. And uh, I could barely move. It shut me down. Uh, I could barely function. I couldn't think straight. Um, totally out of my element. I was laid flat. I felt, it felt like the Lord's hand was on me. And when you say these things, and we say the Lord speaks to us, and the Lord showed me, those are not light things. And sometimes I think they're said lightly. But when I say the Lord, I felt the Lord pressure. I, felt, I, I couldn't pick my head up. I couldn't get my shoulders straight. And that burden lasted for a little over a week. The Lord brought my sin before me, flooded it before me, and not just recent sin, uh, but sin for my li a lifetime was brought back to my memory. I mean, going back to my, my youth. And I saw myself for what I was. I saw that I was a sinner. I saw that I was brutal. I was wicked. I was violent. 
I was all of these things, and the Lord was placing it before me, clearly. And it was a scary, fearful time. And after that week, he graciously lifted it off. And the circumstances I won't get into, but it was a miracle. All I could do was say, thank you, Lord. I walked around the house mumbling to myself, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just couldn't believe it. I was so grateful. And I believe it was at that time that the Lord saved me. Mm -hmm. It's a miracle. He gave me an interest and a desire for his word. I started reading the Bible. And um, I've, I've read about three books in my entire life. And that's, not a, that's no exaggeration. I read the Bible uh, cover to cover. Uh, and I can continue to read it daily to this day. And I'm understanding it and learning more through it and seeing his marvelous work. But legalism grabbed a hold of me, and that keeps you from any joy and peace. The joy and peace that we have today, that I feel today and have felt the last few weeks, you, you get robbed of that. It keeps you from any assurance of salvation. When you stumble, you sin, or you think certain thoughts, you say, I can't be saved. It's, he didn't save me. I can't be saved. Look, I'm, I'm doing this and acting this way and saying these things and living this life again. It keeps you from coming to the Lord. You expect to be changed. When the, when the Bible says he'll give you a new heart, I had it in my head. He's going to take out my heart, stony heart, and he's going to give me a new heart. Well, that's going to be a whole new Gavin. You're not even going to recognize this guy. And that wasn't happening. He was still there. So I was convincing myself, and I, I find later is my pride was keeping me there. And, uh, and legalism is a, is a horrible, horrible place to be. I, and... and if anyone struggles with that, uh, please seek, seek counsel. Talk to me. Um, legalism, it'll focus on your law-breaking. It focuses on the law-breaking of others. It's very inward. It's very prideful. And I was seeing that that's what I was, very prideful. And more recently, in an effort to kind of speed things up here, the, the Lord brought a, another trial in my life. And... Uh, but this time it was men of the church and the Bible and his own word that showed me. And uh, it's amazing grace. And Jesus' is saving grace was shared. And I had a friend who sat with me and a friend who pursued me. You know, I don't have many friends. I don't have many guy friends. I'm not a friend person. I'm not really a one-on-one. -on -one. This person came to me. He wanted to be my friend and said it just like that. I don't think I've ever had anybody even say that to me. But uh, we began to meet, and um, this man who the Lord uses uh, shared with me Numbers 21, 8 and 9. And then he explained to me, you know, that the, what the serpents and the, the biting and the sin, and, and he kind of broke it down so I could understand, obviously. And it, but the, the verse reads this way, And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, sin, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole, and if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Look at the serpent and live. Look at the cross. The, 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 the New Testament uh, verse that relates to that is in John. It's John three fourteen and 15 where Jesus says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. I couldn't believe it. Is it that simple? It can't be. Is it that simple? And as good of a friend as he was, I had to run this by many other men. And they, they all came back and said the same, that yes, uh, it is that simple. I felt humbled, forgiven, and relieved. The Lord did change my heart. Come now to understand that it's all of God. It's all of grace. And there's nothing I can do in myself. The Lord Jesus paid the price, the full price. He died for people like me. And it is for that that I am eternally grateful. Verses 
are now encouraging instead of condemning. In verses like this one, if I may read. 1 Peter 1, 3 to 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. As I said earlier, that when we say the Lord does things in our lives, that's just not a light thing. And um, last year, he brought this verse to me that I, I love very much. Um, and from someone who came from where I came from, boasting was a lifestyle. It was what I did. And in Jeremiah 9, 23, 24, the verse reads, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. As I close, I just want to thank the many who have prayed for, for so long, for me, for Danette, for my family, I want to thank the men of this congregation especially who have encouraged me and shown Christ's love and patience to me. And I know that they know that God gets all the glory in saving a sinner like me. So praise him and his only. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God.